I'm Travis Bader, and this is the Silver Core Podcast. Join me as I discuss matters relating to hunting, fishing, and outdoor pursuits with the people and businesses that comprise the community. If you're new to Silvercore, be sure to check out our website, www.silvercore.ca, where you can learn more about courses, products, and services that we offer, as well as how you can join the Silvercore Club, which includes 10 million in North America-wide liability insurance to ensure that you are properly covered on your outdoor adventures. In this episode, I get the privilege of speaking with Guy Kramer, CEO of Hyperstealth Biotechnology Corporation. Guy is an entrepreneur and an inventor, and if you've worn Sitka clothing or have a camouflage firearm, there's a high probability you have already seen his work. By questioning the norm, Guy pushes the boundaries of possibility into the realm previously thought only to exist in science fiction. Case in point, Guy has invented quantum stealth, a practical concealment technology, or, for a lack of better words, an invisibility cloak, which has practical applications far beyond hiding objects. Listen as we talk about this and more. So tell me, Guy, when did you start Hyperstealth? It was started in March of 1999, and the initial concept of the company was hyperbaric chambers, so one of my partners is an expert in that area, and uh, something I had developed called a passive negative ion generator, which our company went on to patent. Um, that product didn't make a lot of money. Uh, we spent years trying to kind of get it out there, but it took almost an hour for me to explain to people the benefits. And it sounded like a novelty item to most people. Right. So it, it, we, we kind of gave up on that technology and the hyperbaric chambers, the BC College of Physicians came in and change the rules. And you could go down to Vancouver General Hospital and use their chamber for all those issues that they... Uh, service. Right. So why would you go to a private chamber at that point? So there are still private chambers that are running, but we don't know the um, the benefits of the business model that they're using. They're, they keep that privy. And, and we looked at it and said, yeah, the, our model is not going to function anymore. So the name Hyperstealth was actually... From the hyperbaric. From the hyperbarics and the passive negative ion generator. It had nothing to do with <laughs> camouflage at that point. Okay. And in um, 2000. Two, I started playing around with camouflage yeah. and found that uh, I could take what the Canadians had done and I had critiqued them online with the, this web page. I took what they had done and I had proved on it in two hours and a hundred dollar graphics program. Really? And, and it was just me as a taxpayer saying, I've seen how much they spent and how long it took them to do and I don't see the value in what they did. Now, I I was pretty naive in in my assessment. I wasn't an expert at that point. And so I posted it and the King of Jordan's cousin came across the page and the King was looking for a new camouflage for his Royal Guard unit. And he just... And they hired me based on what they saw there. And I'm going, listen, I'm not an expert. As long as you realize that, I'm, I'm willing to work for you, but you need to know this is not my profession. And they go, well... We like what we see. We think it's better than what the U.S. military currently has. And so, well, thank you very much. And I gave myself a crash course on camouflage and found out that the next uh, potential leap forward was going to be with fractals, embedding fractals into camouflage. And a fractal is something that is a a natural geometric shape found in nature. So a simple definition is a fern. Like a snowflake, right? Yeah, a snowflake is, well, they're they're everywhere, but a, a fern... And the small leaf of a fern are almost identical in shape other right. than scale. So that's something that is a, a, a very basic but true fractal that most people have experienced out there. So what we do is we embed these shapes into the camouflage and that causes your subconscious to take longer to determine what it's looking at because the subconscious actually picks up on those shapes in the camouflage and ignores it. As you go outside, you're, you don't want your brain at reanalyzing everything over and over. So right. your subconscious has collected these shapes and basically filed them. And so you go outside and your subconscious is quickly looking at a tree line going, seen it before, nothing important to look at. Write it off, no threat. Yeah. Right. And if we put that into camouflage, we found out that we can actually get a couple of extra seconds based on the testing that we've had done at West Point Military Academy on this. So these fractals, they're 
finite area, infinite perimeter, right? Well, they can be. Uh, right. There, there's a few different. Uh, Mandelbrot fractal. Right. Uh, if you look it up online, there's some great videos where you, it just zooms and for goes infinity. And goes and goes. Yeah. Um, a fractal of a leaf of a fern only goes one level. Right. It'll and, obviously have a finite yeah. perimeter. And so what we're trying to do is find those natural shapes and embed them in. And the shapes have to be belong within that type of an environment as well. So a woodland fractal is not going to function properly in a desert or an arid area. So we right. have to look at all those aspects. And um, very quickly in 2004, as this program accelerated uh and now it was no longer just his royal guard unit it was his entire military his police his customs you name it even the the police and fire in that country wear a blue gray camouflage and that's common in the middle east sure. uh, it's not just unique to the country of jordan so it ballooned into this millions of uniforms and when i had developed these patterns i developed uh about 16 others that they never took. And I thought, well, maybe there's other countries out there. So it kind of ballooned after that. But uh, in 2004, I connected with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Timothy O'Neill, who is the world expert on camouflage. And initially in our weekend conversation, back and forth email, he um, he looked at what I had done and, and this was his territory. So he had that uh, defensive posture. What are you doing? And and why are you doing this? And right. then when he learned I had figured out the fractals and he verified it, he said, do not tell me how you put those into the camouflage because the US military will not use you unless you have something unique to offer. So do not share that with me. And we've been working together ever since. And wow. I still haven't shared with him how I embed them in, but we've been, we've worked together from 2004 till the current time on camouflage patterns. So you had no background in camouflage prior to that? Other than playing paintball. So I was on Canada's top paintball team. Okay. Uh, we placed third in the world and uh, we had won the Canadian championships two years in a row when I was on the team. And I was wearing uh, British camouflage and all the rest of my team were wearing American camouflage and they could not see me. And I, I knew how to do camouflage properly. So I had gloves on, I had a hat that matched. I covered my face and I painted my mask to match. Right. And they could not see me if I stayed stationary out there. And yet I could see them if they were stationary. So this got me thinking there's, even though the camouflages look very similar, there's something going on that's uh, unique about the one I'm wearing. Right. And that got me very interested in, in looking at this. So I'll take a step back. My grandfather uh, invented the walkie-talkie just prior to World War II. He That's had so cool. 56 different patents to his name. He was awarded uh, a medal from the British Empire and the Order of Canada in 2001. So they had blacklisted him because he took the patent out the same day that Canada declared war. Like, um, anything that gets developed in wartime becomes property of the Canadian right. government. So he took, at that point, it was King George. He took the king to court and was the first person in Canada to actually win against the king. <laughs> but that that blacklisted him to the Canadian sure. military. And so it wasn't until 2001 that Adrian Clarkson actually came out and he was uh, his health had deteriorated so much he couldn't go to Ottawa to, to accept the medal. So uh -huh. it, it was a defining moment for him. He didn't want people knowing what he did. He didn't care if... Uh, other people were claiming they had done it first. It, 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 he was all about the science. And so I worked with him for six years right out of um, high school. And he taught me everything that he knew. And, and I'll be honest, most of it went over my head. He was an electrical sure. engineer who had very unique um, ideas about certain things and, and very unique ways of fixing things. So what I took away from that work with him because uh, he eventually kicked me out of the nest and said, I've taught you everything I can, go and apply this to whatever you can in life and and just be smart about what you do out there. And How and old were you when that, when that happened? I started with him when I was um, 18 years old. Okay. So it was six years from 18 to, uh, to six years later. It's a good education. It was. And it, 
it was something that I couldn't get anywhere else. And so I, I jumped on it, but I wasn't his first choice. My, my cousin Morgan was his first choice, sure. who is an absolute genius and worked up at the uh, Triumph Particle Acceleration Lab at UBC. So <laughs> when I kind of volunteered, my grandfather was like, really? Are you sure? <laughs> and I knew he was sitting there going, uh, how do I say no? I yeah. guess I can't. And, and that was exactly it. And for the first year, I think I was in that part of what he believed my capacity was. And he quickly had me learning everything I could out of, uh, university textbooks that were from the library. And he said, guy, if you want to learn anything new, you don't need to just understand biology or just chemistry or just physics. He goes, this universe operates in all sciences all the time, all right. together. So he goes, you need a, a general understanding of all of them in order to start to get that comprehensive outlook on how things work and function. And he was completely right. That completely opened my eyes to uh, the different possibilities out there. And at one point, uh, it's funny because he had me studying something called the quasi benign equatorial oscillation. Okay. And that stands for wind that changes direction at the equator about every two years. Okay. And when I was reading this, all of a sudden things popped into my head and, and it was like the understanding legalese or a foreign language. At one day it just clicked and I understood everything that I was reading. Um, to a point, I can't, right. I can't say that I, I was now Einstein, but it was well, like, you started absorbing everything and it was kind of like immersing yourself in a foreign language. Right. And so I began to, um, challenge him on some of his ideas and I could see the smirk come across his face. Like my, my teaching is starting to have an effect. <laughs> and so he, I was actually going down to New Zealand and Australia and we were studying air ions and he had this very a uh, special instrument that could detect these air ions. And so he had gone down to the Amazon up on a previous trip and said, okay, the, this is how um, these air ions are interacting down there versus in Vancouver. So in Vancouver, we have a predominance of negative ions, which are beneficial for people in breathing in. And in the Amazon, they're very positive. So he assumed the bottom part of the hemisphere was positive ions and the top half of the hemisphere was negative. And I said, no, I think it's like a sandwich. I think the below that it goes back to negative. And uh, he goes, then you come up with the theory that tells me exactly where that's going to happen. And on your trip to New Zealand, I want you to go to that location to verify what you are going to theorize about this. So I said, well, at that time of the year, because this, this zone moves at that time of the year, it should be uh, around Christchurch, New Zealand. So it's me and my dad and I made my dad drive 2000 kilometers down to Christchurch and he used to work for my grandfather. So okay. he, he understood and, and enjoyed the trip and we get to Christchurch and within a hundred kilometers, I verified my theory and I went back and showed him and he goes, you're right. You, you've learned well. And then we met with the head of uh, UBC geophysics department and the head of, head of SFU for the geophysics department. And they looked at this and they said, do you realize what you figured out here? And I, we'd done a stop in Fiji and I go, yeah. And, and they said, you discovered what causes wind. And I said, yeah, I know. And they said, you don't seem very excited about it. And I, I said, well, we've got all these other, other discoveries that came about from that. That's what I'm excited about. Right. And that was very perplexing to them because for them, that would be like a career pinnacle. And, <laughs> uh, then they, they asked me, they said, where's your schooling? And I said, it's with my grandfather. And they refused to talk to me after that. Really? So because I didn't have the letters behind my name, because I didn't have the schooling, I wasn't talking at, at their level. And yet I was translating for my grandfather because he was talking over their head. And th or, this or is... perhaps in their mind, it diminishes the value of their own education. Possibly. It, it, it's been frustrating. But my grandfather went through the same thing as uh, even when he was on loan to the Defense Department he had people that sabotaged his uh, testing of the walkie-talkie because he was so young. He w I think he was about 30 at the time and had no engineering degree. And uh, the general got involved and, and said, I understand what's happening here. And they had him go out and take the test. And he was the first engineer to get his certificate without any post-secondary schooling. Wow. And he blew everyone away on the test. So um, he, he was a very smart man. And I'm sure things sort of changing for him after that, you'd probably yeah. Get a once bit more you've respect. got, and that's kind of what's happened with me now. Now that I've I've got kind of those life experiences behind me, and 
have proven that I've been able to do these things. Now those those schooled people um, are now kind of accepting me into the fold for what I've done done rather than the lack of letters behind my name. Right. Yeah. It's, it's easy to to discount somebody who doesn't have the education or didn't come through the same path as you. Yeah, you, you and see that's, that a lot in life. And, and I get it. That's generally like it's human nature nowadays. Karen on Facebook is the expert in all things, sure, right? Sure. So sorry for all those Karens out there. Yeah. I'm just using that as an example. But I mean, we run into it all the time now with trolls on on these forums yeah. where they they watch a three second video and now they think they understand everything about it and and everyone needs to listen to what they have to say about it. And then it's usually something to cut down the person who's yes. actually created or invented it. The, That's right. The whole unscrewing someone else's light bulb to make theirs shine a little bit brighter. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, like I say, human nature is just something we, I guess we have to deal with. How do you deal with that? Because I can only imagine from what I'm looking at, it looks like it was August 30th, 31st. Yes. That you finally brought this new technology. And we haven't even started talking about what that technology is. We kind of just rolled right into yes. this. Yeah. Uh, to light. And I, you know, before we even talk about it, let, let's talk about camouflage in general. Uh, I'm a little bit interested because I know the majority of what we're going to be talking about is going to be the hyper stealth, the, uh, the quantum stealth technology. The light bending technology. It's yeah. so yeah. cool. It is so cool. I got a chance to look at it and it is so cool. But before you got into that, mm-hmm. you're talking about you're in, into paintball. You were looking at your camouflage pattern. You said you knew how to ap- apply it properly. Where'd you learn how to apply camouflage properly? Uh, there's a lot of information online. You just need to know where to look. Okay. So the the people like Timothy O'Neill, that's how I knew who he was because uh, when the Marines took out the patent on their, they call it MARPAT, but it's CADPAT, which is our Canadian pattern, recolored. So the U.S. Okay. Marine Corps actually asked Canada for approval to use the pattern and Canada offered it to them. And the general that was involved with this uh, spoke to me years later and said, worst mistake we made was just handing it off to them. We should have asked for a royalty, but oh, yeah. um, the Marine Corps then took it on. They changed the colors. The colors are very effective visibly, but near infrared, they sh- the, the green shines like a light. So mm. um, they didn't do the homework that Canada did on their pattern in order to come up with something that was effective across a broader spectrum. Mm-hmm. So when you're fighting at night and you've got an enemy that uses night vision, that's a critical component of your camouflage. And even to this day, the uh, American patterns lack that ability to function effectively at nighttime, where the Canadian patterns were designed to operate in both the visual and the uh, the near infrared. Right. So I looked at the Canadian research that went into their pattern. I looked at the American research. That, so I looked at all the modern research and, okay, what are the experts looking at? What did they do? How did they do it? And... I self-taught my, myself on camouflage and decided to kind of take what the Canadians had done and, and I would work backwards. I would work from the near infrared and then back into the visual rather than the other way around. So okay. when the Americans design a pattern, they design it for the, the visible. Okay, how does it look on the table? Okay, that looks cool. And whatever it's specced at in the near infrared was what they put in the military specification. There huh. was no NATO... Um, number that they went off of to say this is what it should be and nato does have those numbers out there saying this is what camouflage should be at and the funny part is nato's going away from that because all these new multi-terrain type patterns don't meet that near infrared ability so they just kind of ignore it now which to me i shake my head and go yeah as more and more countries are getting access to the night vision and actually just recently the americans have found themselves ambushed by the Taliban and ISIS that are now using these night vision devices, whether they got them from uh, China or Russia, the black market, or even from soldiers from their own country that were selling it to get some money in their pocket, wherever it came from, it's out there now. And what they thought was going to be an issue 10 years from now is here right now. And so the camouflage that they're using, um, so if we look at multicam, it, it only has 13 percent separation between the brightest and darkest color within yes it's on, on, it's on your jacket there, there you go i'm just yeah. looking behind it so so a multi-cam like that yes okay so it's got a 13 percent uh difference between the brightest and darkest color at 
what we determine the the standard frequency for military night vision, which is about 900 nanometers. So that okay. would be like a new moon night when there's no moonlight out there to kind of uh, change that number. A lot of militaries won't go out on the full moon because there's so much ambient light out there. Even right. without night vision, the enemy can see you from quite a distance. So the military uses those tactics out there, but this is a, a key component now. And so the camouflage that we developed under the phase three competition for the U.S. Army, we were a finalist in that competition. The Congress and Senate, for some reason, two weeks before the winner was supposed to be announced, and this is like three years into the this multi-million dollar program, they decided no new camouflage is allowed. And so we couldn't win it at this what? stage. I don't ask me where sure. this came from. Yeah. yeah. And and Cry Precision, who does multicam, was the only group that was already existingly uh, or had camouflage that was existing to the U.S. military. So they de facto became the, uh-huh. the winner of right. this competition. And we knew we blew the night vision out of the water on that one because the military actually came back and said, we've never seen a camouflage that functions down. We were functioning all the way down at 1800 nanometers, which is your shortwave infrared. Right. And that night vision is usually only used by the tier one special forces because it's it can be like $40,000 per night vision device. Okay. Very, very expensive. And um, the reason it's so expensive is because all the bad guys show up as like bright lights out there because camouflage mm. typically doesn't get picked up. And, and it and shows... That's, that's just a passive... Uh, material that's that, right. that will okay yeah so um and that's just due to its design of the the, the pattern or is it, it due to the it's due to the the ink the fabric and uh the colors okay. so colors is probably the most critical but if you really screw up on the on the fabric it it'll reflect so right. um nylon cotton typically works better than polyester in reflectance levels the inks that most of the factories out there uh, don't reflect in that zone but if you have a a dye sublimation so a hunting pattern sure uh that you can get at cabela's and a lot of those patterns are ours we did the whole optifade line for i know i was going to get into that for gore and sitka (laughs) those don't show up in infrared at all so you you look like a glowing beacon out there and we've actually talked to special forces that have used these patterns in missions and uh i'm sitting there going why would you do that and and their reason at the start was we're not allowed to fire until fired upon. And so if they see us and start shooting us, we're now allowed to engage them. And I kind of shook my head (laughs) and said, yeah, that's, that's backwards thinking. A little bit. And I'm going back to them going, if you want that pattern printed properly, as long as I get permission from Sitka or Gore or whoever I've, I've done these patterns for, I can print that for you or get that printed for you. So those patterns are visible in the infrared spectrum? They're not visible. They're not visible. No, what you're seeing is the white base material so the mm. the the optic looks right through the ink okay and uh and sees this bright white non-natural thing in the shape of a human being and you can see that from two yards or 400 yards do animals see in the infrared spectrum uh they believe that birds might be able to see in the infrared spectrum oh, okay um but some of the other nocturnal animals I'm not an animal vision expert sure, sure. and most of what I've done with animals has been in the vis- visible spectrum. So I don't want to um, sound like an expert here. And No, no. Yeah, but I, I did work with an animal vision expert on the optifade patterns, but that was go- geared towards the, the visible spectrum of ungulate or sure. hooved animals, right? Yeah. And so, and then we did one for birds. So we, we looked at the bird vision, which is different than our vision and different than the ungulate vision as well. I'm seeing that Sims, they make chest waders for fishing. Mm -hmm. They're laying claim to making the very first camouflage chest wader that's camouflage for fish eyes. Now I'm not entirely certain that's... uh... Um, Yeah, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what fish can see, even from the experts out there. So when you see fish going up and grabbing a, uh, you'll see them jump out of the water to grab a fly that's on a branch. Mm -hmm. You're sitting there going, okay, they can see and understand the refraction that's going on in the water. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they're seeing things that a lot of experts didn't believe they could see. So I think there's still a way to go, ways to go in understanding what fish see and don't see. Um, I I can tell you right now, and I'm going to let all your listeners in on this trick, they did a study of the spirit bear over on Vancouver Island 
And so these are black bears with almost an albino pigment to them, but they were always larger and they were trying to figure out why are they larger? Uh, It turns out they're eating more because they, they used ABS and PVC pipe in, in the water to see what would happen. And the black pipe, the, the salmon or the fish, trout, whatever they were looking at, wouldn't get close to it. They put white pipe in the water and the fish would almost bump into it. So the spirit bear is just getting more fish coming up to it. So if you want to be a good fisherman, wear white in the water. So white. I just blew Sims thing out of the water <laughs> and there's there's not a lot of money to be made in making an all white waiter out there. But no, because you're marketing towards a person and, yeah, and they yeah. think, wow, camel, that looks cool. That'll be great. But completely forgetting that everything sees on a different spectrum. Yeah. So if you're... If you're actually looking to hide from a fish above the surface, all white would be your best bet that's because they, they see clouds, the fish see clouds all the time. And so for them, that's not an anomaly or a threat. Anything else that you wear, unless it matches the sky or the, the, the background that you're, you're standing in front of, they're going to notice something's there. And it's a survival mechanism. That's a right? great tip. Yeah. Of course. Makes sense. So yeah, there we just lost all our royalties on that. <laughs> Damn, I thought we're onto something here. <laughs> so you started making camouflage patterns. You made it for, looking at the website, of course, when I read it, I saw that you had over 14,000 patents and I'm thinking, holy crow, your patent lawyer must love you. I misread that. You have over 14,000 patterns. Yes. You have over 6 million? Military issued uniforms. Wow. All over the world. Yeah, and it's probably a lot more than that, but it doesn't matter at this stage no. if there's a bunch more or, or yeah, it's it's at least 6 million. Wow. And that's, and you have stuff in use by the U.S.? Yes, uh, the snow pattern for the U.S. Marine Corps. So we developed that under license to them. So they yeah. own that pattern, but that is actually used by all four branches. Okay. And it's actually used by federal law enforcement down there as well. So the FBI would use it in, in certain applications. And it, it, it actually proved to be very effective. It, we thought they were trying to actually see how good Tim and I were in, okay, beat all white for snow. And you're sitting there going, oh boy, this is a big <laughs> test, right? And we actually did that. And in, in a, a flat, snowy terrain, the all white and our pattern tested a little bit worse, but statistically it wasn't enough to, to do any damage to our pattern. But most soldiers in combat won't choose to hide in the open. They'll, no, they'll no. choose cover. And so in those situations, we were much, much more effective than the flat panel out there. So when they looked at the statistics and, and the testing that Tim and I do is objective testing done at West Point Military Academy with... Uh, they test the cadets that they bring in. So the vision, they have all the proper vision levels. Right. And then it's run through a program and it's actually tested on millisecond on how quick they click their mouse over the target and figure out is the target facing left or right. Or And the testing that the U.S. military has done separate from me and Tim is subjective. So they put a rectangle in the middle, middle of a square simulating 40 yards distance and you're going, okay, it's 56 pixels high. It's in the middle of the square. So the question about where is it and what is it are removed because where is it? It's always in the middle of the rectangle. Right. What is it? It's a rectangle. Right. And, and so you look at that and you go, that's not how you should be testing camouflage. No. Right. Because you're now really only testing colors and the actual pattern. So if you take multicam and shrink it down to 56 pixels, yeah. it looks like a digital pattern. Right. It doesn't have those yeah. smooth edges anymore. So you're going, you're not even really testing the right pattern at that at that stage. So there, there's some valid stuff that they can determine in that testing, but there's a lot that they're missing. Okay. And because Tim and I were the only ones that did this, they haven't been able to duplicate it. Are there many other people out there developing like what help hyper stealth is? Uh, we've got a few competitors out there and, sure. and that's healthy to have competition. And you've got cryptic up in Alaska, you've got ATAX uh, pattern, but between countries that are using the patterns out there. The only two that I know now, Cry is just a monster in the camouflage world. So their patterns are, I think they're in 26 countries and and the problems arise because now our Canadian special forces are using it. Right. You're in Syria and you've got the Syrians using it. You've got the Russians using it. You've got Turkey using it. You've got the Canadians using it and you've got the Americans using it. So you're sitting there going, 
all sides are wearing the same thing. Is that not going to cause problems? Right. And the answer is yes, of absolutely. Course. So what we do for militaries out there is every pattern that we've done is restricted to that country. We don't allow it. We don't commercialize it. Yeah, we could make tons of money by commercializing all these patterns, but that's not what we're doing. We're trying to get them a uh, a pattern that is very difficult for an adversary to come in and impersonate uh, one of their groups. And you can only do so much because in, in combat, troops get captured or killed and their uniforms get taken. But sure. that was the reason we got the Afghan contract in the first place was because the, the U.S. woodland camouflage was so easily found. I mean, you could go to your local surplus store in any it's city everywhere. in the world and, and pick up this camouflage. And that's what they were doing. And they would dress as a platoon and go in and just annihilate a base right. uh, dressed up as as Afghani soldiers. So we get called do you have something? And we just happen to have something that they, they ended up using out there. So going back a number of years, years ago in cadets, we were taught about camouflage and they had, well, I think it was five S's and an M and I always forget what those S's are and I've tried Googling it ahead of time and it looks like a lot of other people forget as well, mm-hmm. whether it's uh, shape and size and silhouette and shadow and uh, last one's movement. The camouflage, the dispersion pattern camouflage that you create essentially greatly relies on stationary people, stationary vehicles yes. for it to be as effective as possible. Yeah, we can we can mask some of that movement with the pattern if the pattern is done properly, but it's very difficult. I mean, the the ambient vision is great at at detecting movement out there. And that's one of those, like you were saying earlier, just our instinctual brain. Mm-hmm. When you see movement and animals are the same way, you see a movement bank, you're in high alert. What was that? Should I discount it? Yes, no, and move forward. But you've made something that I think movement is even further. Well, we, uh, yeah, before we jump into that, we actually developed a smart camo. So it's a color changing camouflage. Okay. And we thought that this would be the next big thing. So I showed this video in 2010 at a symposium in Brussels. So there were about 50 experts out there from textiles, and, but it was all about camouflage. And uh, half the speakers were uh, French or foreign language and there was no translation. So <laughs> they were a little boring to sit through. Uh, you'd see four pictures up on the PowerPoint and not understand a word that anyone was saying. But uh, Tim O'Neill, actually, he was a U.S. Army representative and the keynote speaker at that. And so I didn't tell him I was going to be showing this video. And I showed the video and I'm, I'm looking out and, okay, that's weird. No real reaction from anyone. And, and I sit down and I'm the podium is right in front of me and the next speaker gets up and Tim gets up out of his chair and comes down and sits beside me and he whispers in my ear, who have you shown that to? And I said, this is the first (laughs) time. He goes, you can't show that video again. And I said, why not? He goes, because the military is spending millions on this right now and they're not even close to what you just showed. Wow. And then um, he he said, how much did that cost you? I said, "Uh, it was about $1,000 for that prototype. And and he just shook his head (laughs) and he goes... You got to be kidding. So we went to dinner that night and, and we'd been working together. So it, that dinner was going to happen regardless. And his wife was with him and she's a, a lawyer and she was watching the interaction of the crowd. And, and I said, that was a weird reaction. I thought I'd get more of a reaction. He, he stopped and he goes, that was a wow moment in science. He said, we were stunned. Everyone in the audience was stunned that you had done that. So it's funny because the or the speaker, two people in, she was the expert in nanotechnology for the University of Austria. And as she's speaking, she points to me three times during her her speech and going, but he's already done it. (laughs) And I had ruined her presentation because of what I had shown in this video. So that's a powered camouflage source. And the reason I wanted to touch on it is we actually experimented with moving that camouflage to try and mask the movement. What we learned from that experiment was that the ambient vision would pick up that movement on the camouflage. Okay. So out of the corner of your eye, that movement that we're trying to simulate is actually drawing your attention. So that surprised us. We didn't think it was going to do that, even if it's, if it's kind of matching the background, it's kind of like watching Predator, right? The Predator movie. And and you can see something's there from what you're seeing. So or like an ink fish, a cephalopod. Yes. You're watching a, a, a squid or octopus. As exactly. Yes. Right, okay. And they're the masters of camouflage out yeah. there. So 
we thought that was going to be the pinnacle. And then I started working on something called quantum stealth. So it was an accidental discovery. I, I was thinking about the double slit experiment in, in quantum stealth. And I'll, I'll make this simple for the listeners. If you put two slits in a piece of material and you fire a laser at those two slits and you have a wall, uh, so a, a space between that material and a back wall, you right. expect you're going to see two slits on that back wall. Sure. You don't. You see multiple lines on that back wall. And the reason for that, it's like dropping two rocks in a pond and they're creating this ripple. And those ripples interact with each other. And that's what we're seeing on the back wall is that interaction of the light waves. So that's a disruption pattern. Yeah. Well, it's a interference pattern. An interference pattern. Yes. Okay. And uh, I started thinking, okay, could I capitalize on something as those waves spread out to hide a target in kind of one of those th those points in between where the light is showing up. And that got me thinking about this lenticular lens material. So this is a material you find on the front of DVDs that have a, a 3D yeah. image or a movie poster or your kid's book. And the material's been out there since the 20s. And I happen to have a piece without a picture behind it. And okay. so it was only a small piece. And so I had this little object, it was about six inches, and I put it on the couch and the couch had these horizontal lines running on it and the object disappeared and I could see the lines, but not the object. And I thought, oh, okay, there's something odd going on here. If I wasn't into camouflage, I may have dismissed what I was perceiving. Right. And so over the next couple of years, I scaled it up to the point that I could hide myself behind this material. So the video on hyperstealth.com site, uh, we've got over a hundred minutes of videos on there now of this new technology. So the... The patents were, were just published in June by the Canadian Patent Office. Once they're published, you have no reason to keep it quiet out there. Sure. So there was no reason for me to, to hold anything back. And so these videos were released and they were released with a bit of a thud, right? I'm sitting there going, okay, that's odd. I don't think people understand what they're looking at here. And I was correct about that because now the news media is exploding over this. So I spent an hour, I woke up this morning and I spent an hour just copying and pasting to uh, large media outlets out there uh, trying to get access to our videos for right. their websites. And um, that's what I was doing. And th then I had a, a very large US uh, group contact me just before I came to the, the show right. here. So uh, yes, it's starting to explode the way I anticipated. It just took a little longer to get off the ground. So I, I got to think that people are just scratching their heads. They're, they're either thinking you are either A, brilliant, or B, they're being hoodwinked here because how could this be possible? You, you are pushing things to a sci-fi realm here, essentially, where most people thought it was impossible. They, they did. Most physicists thought it was impossible. And only a very small group of uh, physicists at universities understood that uh, in the last couple of years, it had become potentially possible. It was no longer theoretically impossible. And Professor Sir John Pendry out of London had been knighted for his work in bending electromagnetic waves. And the reason he was knighted for that, they called it the first invisibility cloak, but there was nothing on the visual spectrum it was doing. It was all about bending x-rays and, sure. and uh, recently microwaves. And... If you can bend those waves, that means theoretically you can bend light waves. You just need to find the right medium. So they've been looking at nanotechnology and all these very expensive university type applications to solve that problem when all along this material has been in front of them all this time. And so I just happened to capitalize off of it. And I've, I've been able to not just utilize the base material to hide things, which you can't patent it because right. it's been out there for it's all these years. For a while. But I've manipulated this material into 13 different versions. So versions two to 13 are patentable, which is what we have applied the patents for. And uh, version two is simply putting two of these lenses back to back. And it, it provides a very different, unique uh, optical property. So before we started the show, I let you handle a material and see the material and I verify got a chance, it. I got a chance to see them and use them and they work. There is no photo trickery. There's no video magic that's going on. It's very cool. And and really, it's just simple physics. It so really is. There was a Russian scientist back in the late 60s that had theorized 
that bending light was possible. And his work was really unknown for many years after that and never caught on until uh, probably about 10 to 15 years ago when, when this professor kind of picked up the work and said, you know what, he's, I don't think he's wrong about this and started to work towards what he was envisioning. But within his theory, he said, um, if we find a negative refractive index material, which is what our material is, is doing, if we can find that theoretical material, everything in the background should be backwards. So if you've been in a restaurant and you've had a glass of water and you've had a straw sure. in that water, it looks bent and it's bent because light is refra refracting in the water. Yeah. It, it's going at a different speed. And he had theorized that that straw wouldn't just be bent in that same direction. He said it will be bent in the wrong direction. So yeah. it'll look like it's on the opposite side of the, of the glass. And he was correct about that because mm -hmm. our version two just demonstrates exactly what he was theorizing. And version three, we corrected that flip by putting another version two in front of version two. You've basically flipped it a couple of times. And so optically, yeah. when you're looking at it, it's back to where it should be. Yes, exactly. And so again, this was something that, that the current experts hadn't even thought was possible. And so we've just leapfrogged over all these universities that were um, getting grants and we did it without any outside support. We didn't go to the Canadian government and ask them for grants or tax money. I wanted to keep this quiet and I actually did not want this going into the, the public realm. I spent from, so I discovered the, the effect of this material in 2009, 2010 and started doing demonstrations in 2011. So my first demonstration was at Special Operations Command in Tampa. And I had 19 year recently retired US Navy SEAL that advises for me to, he brought me onto the base, sat with me in the meeting, but this was his first time of actually seeing the material. And as we're driving off the base, he said, how does it work on shadows? And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, when we're swimming in the water, coming up on a beach, we can have a great camouflage, but our shadow on the ocean floor gives our position away. Mm. If there's a spotlight or if there's sunlight, it it's very noticeable. And I, I looked at him and I said, I don't know. I never thought to check. Right. right? So I go back home and get uh, a little sample and find, put it under the water and find there's an 80 to 90% reduction of shadow. Wow. And he, I called him up and I let him know. And he said, based on that alone, you have not even on the camouflage ability, just on removing the shadow, you have a product that should be of interest to the US Navy. And yet they didn't seem very intrigued by it. So 2012, I believe I went down to, I was invited down to US Naval Research Lab in Washington, DC. And there were five PhDs in the room. So four of them were Navy and one of them was Army. And they were blown away when they saw this material. So people always go, well, they're, they've got something else. Well, I could tell from the body language and their reaction, they sure. hadn't seen anything like this before. And I was only showing them version one. You've which got is, version 13 now. Yeah, which, w and, and actually up until last year, I only had version two and that was my fail safe. And I would tell them when I would go into these meetings, listen, I'm not going to show you the better version two because I'm showing this to you without a patent in place. So if you mm -hmm. told a friend or a family member and they ended up taking out this patent, you know, that's my fault for showing it to you. Even sure. though we've got an NDA in place and you've signed this, yeah, people sure. talk. And version two makes version one obsolete mm. in, in almost all cases. So that's why I'm not showing it to you. And I found out actually just recently, that's part of the reason the Canadian government got upset at me is I wouldn't show them version two. Right. So, so they just turned their nose up and said, fine, we don't want to look at it. Well, according we to the person, the individual that, that commented and, and he doesn't speak for everyone that was there. That not. he's claiming that was the reason. It really doesn't matter what the reason was, right? They they weren't perceiving or didn't understand what this was going to do. And yet at all these demonstrations, I was trying to get them to understand, you do not want this material out there. You don't, you don't want to fight against this material, let alone have it in and available to the general public. I'm My concern is what the criminal element's going to be doing with this in 10 years. And so my my whole premise of going to the military was buy it, and bury it or buy it and use it sparingly so, so that the enemy doesn't know what you're doing. I, I met with Delta Force, uh, the U.S. Army Tier 1 group, and I said to them, can you guys make it through a room right now that's got motion sensors and heat detectors? And they all looked at each other and said, no. And I said, well, now you do. So 
So the, that the passive infrared defeats a PIR motion sensor, laser possibly? Uh, uh, laser, yes and no. Okay. Um, because we've been experimenting with lasers. That's another patent that we've got. And that was my initial premise was to come up with a countermeasure for this material. So so I've got a quick question on uh, on that, which is one of our locations we had, instead of having bulletproof glass installed, we had a eight mil laminate out of Israel placed on the inside. And what that did was if someone were to try and break in, or if they fired a projectile at the glass, that energy would be dispersed over a larger area, bullets wouldn't go through. But if you fired back from the eight mil lamb side, you could actually all your rounds would go through. Mm -hmm. So with the light bending material that you have here, I've played around with magnifying glass before, and I think that's probably the simplest form of a lenticular lens would be a magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. And you take a couple and you put them in front and you can start making objects flip back and forth. Yeah. If someone were to match that same pattern, would they be able to see back through it? Like, could you make yourself a cover out of this where you're camouflaged? but you could see everything else on the other side? Yeah, that's actually a popular question. That's Is it? That, okay. That's usually the que first question that gets asked when I do these demos and I pull okay. out the riot shield and they're going, but how do you see through it? And, and the, there's a number of simple solutions. We can perforate it like a, a bus advertising wrap that goes over the windows mm -hmm. where you can see out from the inside, but it's difficult to see. And we can put holes in it, like larger holes. You could even put an eye slit, right? Sure. So you, what we're trying to do is most typical combat engagements take place at 40 to 50 yards. And so people that are kind of looking at these videos going, well, I can see the material. Well, A, it's in prototype phase, so it's right. not very clear yet. And B, I'm 10 feet away or closer in every single scenario. Imagine this at 40 yards, you're not going to see it, right? right? So um, those two components together haven't been factored in by those people that are mm -hmm. kind of complaining about this. Uh, and then the third item is even if you know there's something back there, you need to identify what it is before you start to attack it because it could be something friendly. Target it could, identification, it could be a civilian. Yeah. It, I mean, it could be anything. It could be, uh, um, it's funny because uh, I worked with the Bureau of Land Management on visual mitigation of like oil tanks on these big oil farms down in Colorado. And they said, can you make these things invisible? And I said, yeah, but you don't want to. And they said, why not? I said, well, you allow hunters on those grounds. And they said, yeah. I said, do you want bullets going through this material, uh, through your tanks? And they said, no, absolutely not. And I said, well, then it ha there has to be some visual component to those tanks. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to see through a problem and, and figure out some of the problems you're going to run into if you can do what they're asking you to do. Right. And, and Right now, it kind of makes me sound smart by going, oh, no, this is what you want to do. But at the time, I'm sitting there going, thinking about this for a couple hours, going, oh, wait a second. Sure. Yeah, you, I could do it, but you don't want to do this. As a problem solver, as an inventor, your first, your mind naturally goes to, yeah, I can find solutions to that. Yeah. and I, Rather than perhaps starting at the very first question and questioning, should I be finding a solution for that one? Well, it's funny because one of the comments on uh, one of the, the big media outlets that just posted the story yesterday, the, this comment came up that said, I find it hard to believe that a single ind individual could come up with something like this when the universities are spending millions of dollars. And yet history is full of individuals that have come up with sure. lots of problem solving capability. And, and what my grandfather taught me to do was uh, come up with novel approaches to problems and, and look for the half step approach, the hybrid approach. And, and he told me back then, he goes, the world is looking to universities to come up with a new material for something. And he goes, quite often you can go back in the, the lab and find two things and slap them together and they'll work just as well or even mm -hmm. better sometimes. And that's exactly what I've got right now is mm -hmm. something that uh, I was able to kind of grab off the shelf and start to play with and, and utilize those different components that came about because of it. I see when... All you have is a hammer. Everything looks like a nail. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. These guys didn't have grandpa's education. No. Th yes. He, he knew how to, how to fix things. May not have, we, we would get our TVs fixed by him and the TV would often come back with a pair of pliers. <laughs> so you could turn the channel by moving the pair of pliers, but it worked. Sure. Right. The, the aesthetic of it didn't affect him at all. Right. Yeah, that's fine. He, he didn't care what it looked like. Yeah, and so. result, it works. It did. You got your TV. Yeah. yeah. I love it. So the quantum stealth, mm -hmm. just to backtrack a little bit here, I'm taking it the quantum because you talked about the double slit experiment. Yes. And that's to do with quantum mechanics. 
Quantum mechanics. So we, this is another question that comes up on the forums now. Well, do you just use quantum in the start of everything to kind of make it sound like it's more than it is? Mm-hmm. Well, there actually is what we believe. I mean, we, we can't be for certain, but sure. we can look at the evidence. So if you go to our website, there's a section on laser scattering manipulation and deviation. And in the very last, or sorry, in the second video of the three that are in that, uh, that one video, the laser is actually shown in a line. And so we can actually split this laser into a thousand parts with this material. And that shouldn't be possible. And that's the interference pattern. Possibly. Um, possibly. Yes. What we believe is taking place is that there, there's a quantum mechanics uh, taking place. And the reason I say that is that when we create a, a cone out of this material uh, by aiming it at a certain angle and a, on a certain part of the lens, we actually end up seeing a interference pattern within what we're seeing. And so right away when I saw that interference pattern, I knew quantum mechanics was at play here. Mm. Um, and so I phoned up my patent attorney and he's got his master's of science in physics. And I said, listen, I don't have the gr- degree. I think this is what's happening, but can you tell me this was what you think is happening? I said, is this quantum mechanics? And he paused and he said, I think that's the only explanation. He said, you got to remember, Guy, that quantum mechanics is going on all around us all the time. We just don't perceive it like we do with normal physics. Sure. And you've just happened to discover with this material that it's got a quantum component to it. And I then I said, could that be the reason why, after all these military demonstrations, we really didn't get any traction? And he said, I think that is a big component because he goes, you got to remember, you're meeting with people that are not at the top of the food chain. Sure. And the people you're showing it to have to convince the person at the top that what you showed them in that demonstration is viable and real and works within the laws of physics. Mm. And if that person has any understanding of physics, they're going to start shaking their head going, no, until I see it, I'm not going to believe it. And that could be a a huge reason why it was dismissed is that... um, None of this makes sense. Even the chief scientist at the program executive office of the U.S. Army, so that's PEO soldier, I sit down and he, he says, well, what you're about to show me should be impossible. And I only say should be because you're about to show me something. Right. So I pull the material out and within 20 minutes, he turns to his two engineers and he goes, we need to rewrite everything we thought we knew about this because he just proved us totally wrong. And then, then he puts the material down and he says, Guy, I would love to give you financing to move this further. The problem is uh, we have no budget for something that's supposed to be impossible because we thought it was... to sign off on that, yeah. Yeah, he said, we have no requirement in the military to make something invisible because it's supposed to be impossible. Well, they changed this about five months in and they came out with a requirement and and someone in the media actually texted me and alerted me to it. And he goes, this kind of sounds like your material. It was very generic. They don't want to give away what I was doing. They came out with this requirement and I called them up and I said, is this our material? And the secretary that was at the meeting, she goes, yes, isn't this great? This is what you were asking for. And I said, no, it's not great because you guys filed it under an SBIR, which is a small business initiative program that they have in the U.S. And I said, we don't qualify as a Canadian company. And Mm -hmm. she said, but you've got a U.S. company. And I said, yeah, out of Colorado, but it doesn't qualify because it's also made or it's also owned by Canadians. So they threw up their hands and said, we don't know how to work with you which is difficult to believe that with all the the companies that they work with right. in Canada, that they couldn't find a way to work with me on this. But they, they attempted anyway. So is it this why you've gone through the patent route and it's now going to be essentially in the public domain? Yes, it already is in the public yeah. domain. Right. So um, we had given the military uh, a date uh, and that date was uh, late 2018. And I had been down to uh, the Special Operations Trade Show in Tampa called SOFIC in 2018. And um, I, uh, I won't go into the details, but I got a meeting with the Commanding General of MARSOC, which is the Marine, U.S. Marine Corps Special Operations Command. And he looked at the material and he goes, I agree with you, this should never be out there. Mm-hmm. And what do we do? How do we work with you? And I said, whatever you want to do, I will, 
I will work with you. But you better giddy up. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And so he had his staff follow up with me and, and we went back and forth for a couple of months and they alerted uh, the U.S. Army Special Operations Command who eventually sent a soldier up in September. So now we're getting really close to that patent deadline. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I said, you're the last guy, right? It all hinges on you. If you're unable to convince your bosses that this should be acquired, it is going to go the patent route. And I can't stop that train once I file that final patent. So we initially filed something called a provisional patent, mm -hmm. which is the patent office doesn't even look at them, um, but it gives us 12 months to improve on the patent. It gives us a priority date. So I was, uh, I'd already had the provisional patents in place, which meant I could share now with the, more with the military than I could before. Like version two wasn't off limits for them to look at at this point. And that helps. Oh, it, it helped drastically at that sure. point. And then um, you file a non-provisional patent. Well, once you file that non-provisional, it gets to a certain date and it gets published. And it gets published to the world. Right. So anyone can go in and type in hyperstealth. And right now, two of the four are available on the World Patent Office site. And you can't stop that from happening. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason for me to keep quiet about it anymore. It's better for us to get ahead of that release and some sure. Joe on the internet finding it and, and picking some weird aspect out of it and not presenting it properly. So um, I've been working the last couple of months on producing the videos to get out there. And control the messaging. Please. Yes. And and a lot of what I did up until these patents were released, uh, there was always a chance the military or government could come in and, and decide to classify it at last minute. So I couldn't let anyone in uh, mm. on what I'm doing. Now, I'm the only guy at the company. I've had a uh, an assistant years ago, but uh, recently I haven't needed anyone. So when we design these camouflage patterns, they end up getting printed somewhere else. So sure. it really is only a one-man operation. Um, the videos took a little more effort, but I took cinematography at BCIT and, right. and understood how to do this. And of course, with the tools available from your... Apple computer and the programs that they have out there, a lot of high-end studios use the same programming yep. out there to do the same thing. And so it was just a matter of taking what I'd done in those demos and and what I uh, needed to redo in the videos to get the message across on, um, this is what we've done, this is how we've done it, and this is why it works the way it works. Mm -hmm. And uh, the those videos are trending on the internet right now like you wouldn't believe and my twitter feed is kind of exploding i i think i had uh like less than 100 people following me the other day and and now i'm up to 400 and and i got to turn off the notifications because people are trying to communicate with me that way and the media's the in in constant communication with me about this but yeah just us talking right now your phone's buzzing off the hook it, it is yes and um it I learned from the CNN interview that I did in 2012 uh, to do this differently. So what happened there was they interviewed me about the camouflage we had done for the U.S. Army. And it was a three-hour interview that they ended up cutting down to two and a half minutes. Sure. And that got on YouTube and for it's now got three million hits and every troll out there was looking at it. Because we couldn't show the material, we sh were sure. showing mock-up photos and I told CNN please mark them as mock-up photos before you post them up. And they didn't, did they? They didn't. No. And of course, that caught, that made us look uh, like we were trying to pull the wool over sure. everyone's eyes. And so I put up a web page explaining this, and that that uh, limited some of that response, but not a lot. And so um, it's very therapeutic to go through all those comments that have been on there for years and go, we've done it, go <laughs> here. And, and I'm not attacking anyone, it's just... No, um, but when Fancy Pants 55 comes on and tells you that you're absolutely off base and here's why, it's kind of nice to come back and just say, here it is, yes, take a look. Yeah, and and the way that we dealt with that, I looked at and I said, okay, this time we're going to do it differently. Rather than me going to the media first and them kind of dictating how the story gets told, and every story that's come out so far has had some level of something incorrect about it. Sure. Um, it's amazing what you can say to someone in an interview and how they take that. Uh, one of the articles said it has to be curved and I'm looking at that going, no, that's not what I said. And how did you get that? Well, all the examples he saw were curved and well, I can attest it doesn't have to be curved. No, I've seen it. No, it stands up on the table because it's curved sure. uh, and makes it easy. So I don't have to be holding it, mm -hmm. uh, but it can be uh, flat or curved. It, it doesn't make a difference. 
Um, but we wanted to get that narrative out ourselves. So if you go to our website, you'll see a 57 minute technical video that tells you how and why and when um, all those little boring things and 10% of the people have actually watched it all the way through. So I've got all those analytics. You looked at the metrics. Oh, out. yeah. And so I, I looked at the metrics and I, I actually was able to cut down where I was losing people. And so we ended up cutting it down once to, I think it was 23 minutes. And then we cut it down to uh, 18 minutes and then a nine minute one. And then I cut it down to a couple of minutes from there. And so you can take those metrics and figure out exactly where people are drifting. Right. Right. In this world of Instagram. It's hard it. to keep people focused. And yeah. so the, the, the people that are attacking it now, it's very easy for me to go back and go, no, go look at this video, right? right. Um, obviously, you haven't looked at them all. And, uh, and just a word of warning to all those people that want to critique this, please watch all the videos first because it'll save you a lot of embarrassment um, <laughs> later on. I had people going, oh, yeah, it, it, if I brought out my thermal camera... I'll be able to see it. No, like clearly. It stops thermal, right? right? Uh, obviously, you didn't even watch six minutes into the video to find out that it stops thermal. And in the shorter videos, it comes up at like the one and a half minute mark. I may be one of those 10% that have actually watched all the way through on your videos. <laughs> and when I look through there, now that it's out in the public domain, yeah. so it's aside from even though it's called quantum stealth technology and the public, so we think about camouflage, we think about hunters and anglers, but it does other things as well, too. You're talking about being able to use it as a uh, multi-projector. Is that... Uh... Yeah, so uh, Special Operations Command actually has me coming down in January to demonstrate this to them. At a, They've got a, a civilian arm called the Softworks, and they work hand-in-hand -hand with SOCOM. And they actually came out with a competition in late August, just as my videos are, are about to go up. And the competition is... Um, we think industry is getting close with holograms to be able to allow us to use them as a defensive tool in uh, operations. And could you, if you're interested, please submit a white paper. And so I registered, but I hadn't submitted my white paper and then they canceled the competition. Oh. And right when they canceled, I had actually had my video up for one or two days on these holograms and it's a 17 minute video on our website. And so I sent them the link right away and I said, I met most of your requirements. And the lady responded back in an hour and she must have watched the whole video. And she goes, I've submitted this to my bosses and they've contacted me twice since then to say, we want you to come down and show us what you have. So they're looking at it as a way of creating a holographic wall in an urban setting. So in an urban setting, you can't dig a trench or a foxhole to hide in. Right. And if there's no uh, cover to hide behind, what do you do? And they're looking at this going, okay, even though it can't stop bullets and it's not meant to stop bullets in this right. current configuration, at least you can hide behind it so the enemy can't see you to start shooting at you. So concealment instead of cover. That's right. Yeah. And so we've been able to show um, that not only can we put a still image up there, but we can put a video up there. So I can put a, a soldier, a decoy soldier on this thing that it, if I've actually got it in the studio here would look way better than you actually see on the videos because the camera is compensating for the projector light that's coming through. Right. So essentially how we're doing this is we're, we're firing uh, the projected image through the lenticular lens in one polarization. And then there's a gap of a few feet between the first lens and the second lens. And the second lens is in the, the opposite polarity. Right. So if one is vertical and one is horizontal or vice versa, yeah. the image will stop on the second one and you're looking at it going, that shouldn't happen. And the, the physics that's actually occurring between that gap, I don't know what's going on there. But it I, works. I have a general idea of what's sure. happening, but it doesn't make full sense to me. So are we and, back in the quantum realm again? I think we are. And, and that's great because um, it, when you file a patent, you don't need to know how it functions. Right. You only need to know how to build it and what the outcome is. You don't need to know the middle part which is what I, I don't sure. fully comprehend what's going on here. So I've been able to few, do a few different simulations uh, with that uh, holographic side. And the video show, we can actually put decoy animals up there for the hunters. So they're not having to carry the full-scale plastic beast in the back of the truck, yeah. right? They can actually put whatever they need to on this material that weighs literally a couple of pounds and have a battery-powered projector 
that works for four hours before it needs to be recharged out in the middle of a field. I'm, I'm thinking about a, a decoy spread of, of hundreds of snow geese decoys set up. Wouldn't it be great just to flip a switch and have all of them just appear? Yeah. And, then... and again, you, you're trying to, you're trying to improve upon what's already out there. Sure. And one of the companies we work for, I won't name them, but they're a hunting company. They do a lot of decoy sales right. and they were not happy when I told them about what we were able to do with this new technology, but they hadn't seen it. So in their minds, it was, oh, maybe he's kind of making this up or elaborating on this a little. <laughs> let's, let's hope that's where he's going with this. Um, and sure enough, yeah, we've, we've proven that we, we can do what we said we could do. I know I've got a ton more questions, but I got to be respective of the listener's time yes. as well. So I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions afterwards sure. because yeah. uh, you are just a wealth of information. The stuff that you're inventing here is crazy cool. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure having you on here. Well, thanks for having me on. I have a passion about this stuff, so I enjoy talking about it. And that concludes this episode of the Silverport Podcast. 